Okay, welcome to Denbydale Radio Club uh, for our talk tonight on radio aboard the RMS Titanic. Um, our speaker, and I'm delighted to welcome him to his first meeting at Denbydale, is uh, Fred uh, VE1FA. So, Fred, I'm going to hand the microphone over to you. <clears throat> okay, thank you, Nick, and uh, I'm pleased to be there. I, I'd rather be there in person, to tell you the truth, but... Uh, uh, that's not going to happen for a little while yet. Uh, this uh, the presentation I've got here was I first did back in uh, 2012 for fairly obvious reasons. It was the 100th anniversary of, of the Titanic disaster. And uh, uh, it's been sitting quietly on my computer, but every now and again, if I see something interesting, I'll add it. So the, the thing has grown. And initially, I talked about all three of the topics I have up here, how it worked, the effect of the radio on the disaster and the effect of the disaster on the radio. Uh, that's no longer possible in uh, 45 or 50 minutes. So I'm going to just do the first section. Uh, hang on a minute there. Oh, I didn't mean to do that. Let me go back. So um, uh, I'm just going to talk. So this is going to be uh, rather more the technical side. And first I have, a, uh, I guess, uh, somewhere between an apology and a defense, and that is that uh, there's an enormous amount of material available on the Titanic, as I'm sure you all appreciate, and trying to sift out the uh, wheat from the chaff is very difficult. If you Google, for instance, uh, uh, Titanic radio room, you'll get more than 50 different images, everyone different from all the others, and uh, so it, uh, based on, I, I did get some old uh, Marconi paperwork, but it looks like Marconi England is like Marconi Canada, that once they're not selling an item or servicing it, they throw away a lot of the paperwork. So th there's not that much available. Anyway, I'm giving you what uh, a lot of looking and, and uh, going to a lot of sources, especially the Antique Wireless Association of, of uh, Canandaigua, New York, which has uh, a lot of really good original information. Anyway, I've put together what I certainly hope is uh, uh, an, a correct and accurate description of the radios of, of the time and how they worked. Okay, let's go on. This fellow, hang, hang on, I'm still getting uh, a bunch of other stuff on my screen here. See waiting room. No, I don't want to do that. Uh, can, can, is, is my screen obscured there, uh, Nick? By uh, oh, I can, I can sit. Your slide is up with discovery of radio waves with Hertz. Yeah, okay, because I, I can only see part of it. There's a uh, John G4NDP has entered the waiting room for this meeting. Okay. Oh, there it goes. Okay, good. Uh, okay, so this is uh, uh, old Heinrich Hertz, the discoverer of radio. And uh, you'll notice in blue down here, he says something that he probably wished hadn't popped out of his mouth at that moment. I do not think that the radio waves I have discovered will have any practical application. Actually, what excited him was that there was a very canny Scott physicist named uh, James Clerk Maxwell uh, in the 19th century. And he worked out through mathematics and experiments that light was electromagnetic radiation. And he postulated, his theory was that uh, uh, sparks would also emit electromagnetic radiation. So uh, Hertz's uh, objective was to prove Maxwell's theory, which he did. And this gadget here, is uh, what he used, essentially an induction coil with a little interrupter which connected and disconnected the coil so that it would connect it. Uh, you'd have an electric magnetic field formed, of course, around the two windings. The iron in the, in the coil would act as a solenoid, would interrupt the interrupter. The field would collapse and you get a large secondary EMS which put a spark across these little spark balls. And this had been done many times before. He then uh, took a ring uh, about 15, I think about 15 centimeters in diameter, put two spark balls and discovered that it could put it a meter or two or three from the main device and he got a secondary spark. And uh, because of the size of the ring, we know that the very first intentional radio emissions were on about 300 megahertz. And uh, the the, the interesting thing is him saying that he doesn't think it'd be any practical application. But if you were to replace his switch up here uh, with a Morse key and you started operating the Morse key, you would get a visible signal that you instantaneously or near instantaneously transmitted uh, a spark through space. You could see it and you could hear it. 
but uh, so this, of course, excited people like Marconi uh, and uh, uh, Popov in Russia. Uh, they actually were about as equally successful in sorting out a reasonable radio. But of course, we've heard all about Marconi because he was in Western Europe and not so much about Popov because he was in Russia. Uh, so here's the song. Uh, here's a little thing. Can you get rid of that? Uh, I've got another admit on here. It's blocking this, the, the picture. But they, he probably can't see it. Well, I, I can't read my oh, slide with it. Okay. So can you move that thing? Let me just see if I can move it somehow. No, it doesn't want to move. I don't like, I just click admit, I guess. Okay, okay, that works. All right, so this is, a, um, I'm going through this because it's much easier to understand the synchronous five kilowatt rotary spark gap on the Titanic. If you understand it's, it's a, a, a basically a simple descendant with a lot of en engineering and ingenuity uh, plowed into it of the classic uh, spark transmitter. And uh, so at the top here, we have it in theory. And of course, same sort of setup, uh, actually in the States, I don't know what was used in, in the UK. Uh, the Model T Ford it came out in 1909 and they made 15 million of them. And each one had four spark coils. So that's 60 million coils. So for the beginner, you usually started with a Model T spark coil, which is in here. Uh, by the way, can you see the uh, cursor all right, folks? Yes. Yes, Fred, okay. we can see it fine, yeah. yeah. Okay, just to be sure. And so um, basically exactly the same principle as, as uh, Hertz's original device. Uh, so this is, think of this as, this is all audio, of course. You've got a, a key or a switch here. The interrupter starts buzzing, uh, pulled up. Uh, and then uh, because the current has been cut off by it's being pulled up, it drops back. And the old fashioned uh, electric house buzzers, uh, if you couldn't afford a nice bell, uh, worked it exactly the same way. And uh, in induction coils of all descriptions use the same system. So this is all audio. So what you are doing then is the, the collapse of the secondary, uh, the EMF um, field uh, induces a spark across here. And the oscillatory circuit, as they used to call it. This, by the way, this is an old fashioned diagram for a simple capacitor. It was actually usually a stack of window panes with metal in between uh, connected together. Um, so this, this uh, has some resonant frequency, of course, so long as the spark is jumping and you get uh, that transferred into the antenna system. If you were really lucky or really knew what you were doing, you could have this as a, re a resonant circuit as well as this, which would give you better selectivity. But what this put out was what was called a damped wave. And uh, uh, it was radio, but right away they realized that this is very inefficient. So this isn't four E's. This is you push the, you push the key down once and this is what comes out. And, and of course, each of these is one cycle of the buzzer, the little uh, the system here. And so the most, most of the time you've got key down, you're not putting out very much power. For a good part of it, you're not putting out any power at all. Um, so uh, it worked and uh, that, that's great, uh, but uh, uh, it, it left a lot to be desired. So uh, when people started here, well, Marconi started trying to get from one end of his house to the other. And then eventually he, was on, he lived on a fairly big estate. So we got further and further with more improvements. This is what, at least in North America, uh, an old, uh, before the days of regulations and such tiresome things, people would just get on the air. And this was the kind of system they would set up. And, and uh, a large battery, an old auto battery, likely a key, uh, Model T uh, spark coil, a stack of window panes and metal for your condenser, a spark gap. And they'd use this broad copper strap about an inch or an inch and a half wide coiled like this because that made this uh, a capacitor as well as an inductor. And so you had a resonant frequency here and uh, you had usually wooden dowels. Uh, this was like, there was, I don't know if they were in the UK, but there was towel racks that uh, had wooden dowels and you, you hung your various towels on it to dry out. And they, they'd, uh, someone would take the towel rack from the uh, uh, house and uh, turn it into coils, which had variable coupling. And, uh, you probably have noticed that uh, in these old sets, they often had four or six parallel wires, or sometimes they had a cage of four or six in a circle. And 
There was a reason for that, although probably not many people uh, understood it back in circa 1907, 1908. And that was that uh, uh, the earliest sets were mostly around 150 kilohertz or kilocycles, excuse me, we're going back in time. And the wavelength of 150 kilocycles was two kilometers. So if you put up a dipole, it was one kilometer long, which of course most people couldn't manage. So by putting, uh, they didn't know it at the time, but by putting a lot of wires in parallel like, parallel like this above the ground, they were creating a very effective capacity cap, which greatly shortened the length you needed to achieve resonance. So a relatively short antenna could be much more efficient if you had all these par parallel wires. Hang on, Whoop. what's going on here? You uh, admit. Okay, okay. No, just just that my uh, my advanced key isn't working. Hang on. Oh, okay. I can use I can use the the mouse. That's that's fine. Okay. This is um, um, what uh, the the Model T uh, uh, spark coil evolved into. This is this is a a beautiful machine probably made in, in, in Chel Chelmsford, Nick, because it's, um, I can't, can't read the little uh, item there, uh, but this is a, uh, a coil which will uh, absorb 500 or 1000 watts of DC power. So you have your, your, your battery or other DC source, the key feeding in, here's your buzzer, and this will put out a very substantial spark. And then your, your resonant circuit connects to the sides of the two spark balls and, and you have basically the same circuit as we just saw. This is about 1907. This actually was uh, in an advertisement. They were trying to sell it, and the asking price was 6,700 U.S. dollars. So I am not planning to start a collection. Okay, um, here's the Titanic, and we'll look first at at, at her antennas, um, and uh, just some of the numbers that you may or may not know that she was about 53,000 tons, 880 feet long. Uh, with a beam of 92 feet, 46,000 horsepower. Well, that number you'll see vary because with steam engines, it depends on, on what pressure you assume the steam is under. In the Titanic, they were using 185 PSI steam uh, pretty well throughout. And there was 2,224 people on board with two radios. The antenna here shows, uh, I suspect the picture has been doctored a little bit uh, because at that distance, the wires aren't that big in, in diameter. Anyway, the, the, the ship is 800 feet. These two masts are about 500 feet apart, and the antenna is, is, is twin T antennas, 450 feet long uh, on the horizontal plane. The back where it's dark here is actually tarred hemp uh, because they, it's a balanced antenna. The radio room is exactly where the four uh, uh, wires come down. They, they, they all join together at the bottom. They all go in as, as a single circuit. Um, and uh, the thing when you add up the uh, here's a here's a better look at the antenna. So each end had a, a 20 foot ash spreader to, to give the, the uh, proper horizontal arrangement. And these little affairs here, these are the insulators. This is your tarred hemp back here, or like rat line as I called it in the days. So, so uh, antenna A six feet to six feet between the two eight feet and, and another six feet six foot spread for the second twin T antenna. And so the height of this above the deck was uh, 190 feet above the ocean around 250 feet. And uh, with the 490 foot um, downlinks, you had uh, almost half a mile of heavy bronze wire in the air for your antenna. And uh, talking of a dream antenna, uh, you had a, the enormous amount of wire you were, you were 250 feet over the ocean, and then the saltwater ocean, of course, is a perfect ground plane, as is the, the solid steel uh, uh, ship that you're connected to, and there's no obstructions around. So this was all very important because one of the key things to appreciate about these early radios is amplifiers had not been invented. So when you were listening to a receiver back in the day, uh, what you heard when you heard a faint signal or a strong signal for that matter, was the energy which came directly out of the transmit, the distant transmitter. Today, you listen to your receiver and you're listening to a, a greatly amplified facsimile of the energy which came from the distant transmitter. So um, you needed a really big antenna if you wanted any sensitivity because <laughs> you weren't gonna get any help from your receiver. So um, uh, 
the thing has a re had a resonance of 930 kilohertz or about 325 meters, which initially you say, why is that? Because almost all the marine activity, certainly all standard ship communications was at 600 meters or 500 kilohertz. There we go. Yeah, okay. So uh, to give you just a layout of the, the setup on the ship, uh, this is at the, uh, the silent, the, the Marconi rooms, as they were called, were uh, about maybe 75 or 100 feet back from the bridge, which was a, would have been across the, the left-hand side of the image here. And uh, in the Marconi setup, there was uh, two operators. And so there was a little a pair of bunks for them, a very small uh, bedroom. Then there was the main room with a table at uh, the left here, which contained all the receivers and a lot of controls and so forth that you'll be, you'll be seeing in a moment. Then there's this silent cabin, which was <laughs> exactly what it was not. The three boxes represent uh, uh, about a, a, a 12 to 15 horse DC drive motor. Uh, hang on, there we go. Uh, an AC alternator which produced the AC, which was then stepped up to the operating voltage and what was called a rotary disc discharger. Uh, okay, and we'll, the silent room in fact was uh, heavily lined with wood. And uh, when, you, uh, when you started the, the transmitter, everything was nice and quiet. But when you put the key down, uh, there was a tremendous roar because uh, the disc discharger was discharging um, 14,000 volts at a third of an amp. Uh, uh, thousands of times uh, a second, and uh, it made a heck of a noise. I heard, I've heard one of these machines years ago at the Antique Wireless Association. They had an old 250-watt uh, 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 Shore model, which, which ran on AC, not DC. And uh, when that thing was keyed down, I would, I would say, I would guess that it, it put out about an 80 to 100 decibel uh, racket, just like ripping metal or, or constant lightning. And so to, uh, and you see the SRs on the adjacent rooms, that's for state rooms. And uh, I'm sure that this wasn't the prize state room because uh, this thing absolutely roared. So the discus charger was in a teak box with asbestos padding inside. And then they put heavy wood all over this room to try to keep the racket down. There we go. Okay, again, here's the, here's the damped wave, which was characteristic of the, the spark time. And fairly quickly, engineers and people that understood radio realized that it was not efficient because uh, uh, most of the time, this is not 4Es, again, it's, it's your, your, your thumb on the key or your finger on the key. Uh, and so most of the time that you were transmitting, or a lot of it, you weren't transmitting. There was almost nothing coming out of the transmitter because the... Um, the, uh, the, the, the tuned circuit struck by the high voltage spike is the, the good analogy is a church bell that uh, you strike it and it resonates till uh, internal resistance and whatnot causes it to die out. And this is what's happening. And the more heavily you loaded uh, a circuit with this intermittent uh, spike striking it, the quick, more quickly it died out. And so if you lo loaded it lightly, you could have a nice long, uh, ring, but uh, you weren't putting it out on the air. So if you wanted to put something out in the air, it had to be heavily damped. This is just a, uh, a version on a, from a scope of a damped wave. So it, it's interesting that uh, if you ask people, well, what's, how are they communicating on those old radios? All people say, oh, it was all CW. Well, actually none of it was CW, continuous wave. It was all Morse code, but there wasn't any CW. Here's what we use today, of course, uh, uh, a nice clean continuous wave. So. Uh, uh, yeah, a very power rich signal. This is what they managed to develop for the Titanic. And uh, so they've gone from the damped wave to this actually, you can call it continuous because uh, they never get to the point where there's no, uh, no emission in, in when you depress the key. And probably best called something like modulated damped uh, A2 uh, continuous wave. And this was uh, much higher as we'll see in frequency. This was at eight, 840 hertz, and as you know, most CW ops, Morse code operators like a side tone somewhere in the uh, 600 to 800, 850 hertz range. And so this was instantly recognizable on the air back in the day that uh, no other machine had this 840 hertz musical note. 
actually, uh, at first there was one on the air, and that was the sister ship of the Titanic, the Olympic, that was uh, launched from Harland and Wolf in 1910. And 18 months later, the Titanic was launched and put a second uh, uh, musical 840 hertz note on the air. Uh, this is looking at uh, the sparks you could get out of the, some of the old transmitters. And so here, uh, it was convenient if you were operating from your home just to use uh, home power uh, to run a step up transformer. And then of course, everything's at 60 Hertz. And this is what the sort of thing you'd see at 60 Hertz. Now imagine you're down uh, either one or 200 kilohertz or you might be up as high as 500. And, uh, but down there, as you all appreciate, it's very, very noisy. And so this sort of signal would get buried in noise very easily. It was just, just a bit of hum. And uh, so a signal like this, you would need more power uh, than you would, uh, even if these had equal power, the last here would be very recognizable as a signal. This would not, and this is somewhere in between. So uh, here, uh, this is, this is what basically what a modern signal looks like, of course. So the, th the first E would be easy to miss at a given power output. This would be easier to uh, hear, and this would be quite easy to hear. So um, this was another advantage of having a high spark repetition rate that you could, you could get something which uh, was much easier to pick out of the background racket. And remember, one of the great disadvantages of not having amplifiers is that you couldn't have a highly selective receiver because you'd be um, basically, there's no way you can amplify what's left and you'd, a highly selective receiver is a highly lossy receiver. So um, you had a choice with those old things of having selectivity, but no sensitivity or, or a little more sensitivity and no selectivity. Okay, now, now uh, by about, I think about, it was about 1908 or nine, uh, a new idea came along and that was uh, that you want to get faster sparks so you get closer to the continuous wave. So uh, what was done was uh, you uh, set up an, a basically a DC drive motor or it could be an AC drive motor setting up an alternator to run at a relatively high cycle rate, uh, uh, 300, 400, 500 hertz, something like that, which would give you a much faster spark repetition rate than the old uh, buzzer on the uh, induction coil. Uh, so hang on, I got ah, the darn things in the way. Okay, just a minute, let me get it out of here. There, okay, yeah. now I, co I couldn't see the, uh, the uh, presentation. Here we go. So you'd have a, a conventional step up transformer. And again, this is, remember, this is all audio. So, uh, you now have a rot rotating spark gap. So these little studs will be made of tungsten or some other durable material. And they're on a motor, which is spinning rapidly. And uh, of course you need the two studs lined up with the two spark balls to get the spark to jump. But when that happens, a spark jumps and you get your uh, oscillatory circle, uh, circuit oscillating and, and, and coupled to an antenna, you uh, radiate. But uh, there was a problem. Uh, and they discovered that, uh, they, well, they just didn't think of it. But uh, uh, of course, here's the sine wave that would be put out by the alternator and an amplified version of which is going to be across the stepped up secondary here. So, so this is gonna be thousands of volts. And of course, if this isn't synchronized directly with the AC, uh, the alternator, then um, the sparks are gonna come at random points in the cycle. So you get a beautiful strong spark if, uh, you, uh, if, if the studs line up at the two peaks uh, there and there, but if um, you're at this point and the studs line up, you're getting nothing. And if you, uh, hang on there, uh, or if you're at this point, you're gonna get a weak spark. So what was needed was to drive the alternator and the rotating spark gap on a single shaft so that it was synchronized. It was a bit like that business in the first world war where they, mounted machine guns on the, the noses of the biplanes. And, and uh, uh, at least, uh, I think the Germans right away thought of synchronization, but uh, other people didn't. And uh, it was very embarrassing when you shot off your propeller. So in the same way, this uh, you need the synchrony. So uh, the studs mechanically line up 
when you're at the positive and negative peaks of the sine wave that's generated back here by the D, so the uh, alternator. Okay, I, I know there's a lot of numbers here, but uh, yeah, I mean, if you're going to understand the machine, you have to have a few of them. Um, so the machine that was on the Titanic and the Olympic, although you will find online people saying it was something else, but I, I, I can tell you there's many reasons why I'm, I'm certain that this is the case, um, that it's called the Marconi five kilowatt synchronous rotary spark. They made a smaller one, the one and a half kilowatt version, but the bigger one was used on the Titanic for, for lots of obvious reasons. Um, I'm just mentioning a few of the people that contributed here. There is a chap named Ernest Rutherford, who was a, a brilliant physicist around the turn of the century, New Zealander, who um, actually, he was at my old alma mater and won a Nobel Prize there for uh, um, uh, explaining what radioactivity was. Radioactivity had been found, but nobody understood it. He uh, invented a device called the magnetic detector, which all the, the, the ship operators called the Maggie. There was another bright young uh, uh, English uh, engineer, C.S. Franklin, who worked for Marconi. Marconi uh, is famous because of, of uh, the, the uh, 7777 patent he took out on tuning, that people didn't think of putting tuning into their radios till Marconi figured out that uh, uh, it was possible and it was necessary to have any selectivity. So um, he, the C.S. Franklin was hired by Marconi to develop a really good tuner and he did it, it's actually it's 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 amazing it looks like it should have been invented years later but uh, he invented it uh, in uh, 1907 i think it was and reginald fessenden is a canadian uh, uh, electrical uh, engineer and he um, invented the rotary spark that we were just talking about sometimes called the disc discharger so the radio was uh, installed aligned tested uh, by the Marconi operators on the Titanic, um, the, uh, the operators weren't employees of the White Star Line, they were employees of uh, uh, Marconi. And because what you did was you didn't just buy a radio from Marconi for your ship. You, uh, you basically, um, I think you actually rented the radio and uh, the, uh, you were paid, so you paid as the owner of the ship, you paid Marconi's a fee, and that included the salaries of, of the two ops, and who in this case were uh, Jack Phillips, a young, young man of 25. By the way, although Jack was uh, only 25, he'd been a Morse operator for 10 years. At 15, he went to the, the, the government post office or the railway, and so he spent four or five years um, sending um, Morse for the railway, and then he joined up with uh, Marconi and he was on several ships before the Titanic. Harold Bride was the assistant uh, operator and he'd actually been uh, uh, on I think three, three other ships before the Titanic came along. And uh, so they basically, they went to Harland and Wolf in, in Belfast, the, 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 uh, the shipyard. They were then sent the machine and I've not seen it mentioned, but I think we can assume that they always, they sent a field engineer because what the field engineer would need to do was that the, the designer of the ship would leave a room or two and say, oh, the radios go in there. But then the engineer had to figure out just what was the best way to install them, where to lay the wires, where to have the antenna feed through, et cetera, et cetera. So, any, but anyway, they, uh, the, these two guys, and the initial testing and, and alignment would be fairly elaborate with this machine. Once it was in, most of the controls could be left alone, but uh, it, was, it was challenging. So when they got on, they knew the radio. Um, and so the radio and the Titanic were fully functional, 2nd of April, 1912. The call was MGY. All the, uh, Marconi had uh, a, a complete monopoly on ships radios in, uh, out of Britain and, and uh, other places as well. And so they all began with M and apparently, uh, since all the British ships were M this or M that, the operators after a while would just drop the M, you know, just G, they, they calling just, they'd call just GY. So a quick look at the power that was available for the, uh, uh, from the Titanic for the radio. Uh, the main power was uh, four uh, uh, steam cylinder engines uh, connected to four big DC generators and uh, they, uh, the highest voltage used on the Titanic was hundred volts. Uh, reference to the deck. And, uh, but it was 100 volts at 16,000 amperes, which is a fair amount of current. And this actually, that was from four 
steam uh, motor gens. And so each one was 4,000 amperes. And the normal use of the Titanic just took two of them. So it, it, got, it got by on a, a near 8,000 amps, but everything that everything on the Titanic that could be was uh, uh, electric. They had electric elevators and all the stoves were electric and there's thousands of electric lamps and heaters and pumps and everything. Actually, one thing they didn't uh, switch over was the, the main bilge pumps, these huge pumps down in the, in the bottom of the hold because it was kind of wasteful. They, they ran them on steam because if you ran them on electricity, you'd, you'd take steam, you'd put it through your motor generator into electricity, then the electricity would be converted to mechanical motion, which is much less uh, efficient than just uh, driving the, the, the bilge pumps with the steam directly. Anyway, emergency, they had a completely separate wiring system with hundreds of bulbs in it on two 30 kW gens, uh, which provided 600 amps for emergency service. They were never needed. Uh, right till the, the bitter end, the, uh, the mains uh, provided the lights for the Titanic. And the Titanic was lit until less than two minutes before it's, it finally sank beneath the waves. What finally, what finally knocked out the lighting on the Titanic was uh, that when the ship broke in half and then you, you broke all the steam lines and you broke all the wires which shorted out and, and no, no system's gonna survive that. But uh, the interesting thing is that uh, the captain turned off the steam as soon as uh, the Titanic had encountered the iceberg. He you know, cut all engines. So uh, for two hours, actually about two and a half hours, the, uh, uh, the lights of the Titanic and the uh, a number of other functions and the transmitter continued to function. And the reason is that there was 40 boilers on the Titanic and, and men, almost all of them were running. And uh, so they had an enormous reserve of 185 PSI steam. So it just kept going. Towards the end, um, one of the two ops, uh, Bride, uh, had to spend most of his time adjusting and retuning as the voltage fell from 100 volts down to 90 and 80 and 70 as, as the, the steam was exhausted. And so the, the, the motor gen started to, to uh, weaken. So the uh, transmitter, uh, it's interesting. Uh, I'll always say the transmitter because if you think about it, the receiver took zero power, not a, not a microamp here. It was just running on the signals out of the air. So, but the, the transmitter normally ran on 100, 110 voltage. There's a little variation, I guess, in the ship's current at 60 amperes or six to 6.6 .6 kilowatts. The power out, um, I don't know. And I don't think it wasn't measured. They didn't have the technology to measure it, but they did have a way to peak the tuning. So maximum amperes were coming out. And, and this sort of system was used for a long time. I, most World War II radios, uh, even little ones in planes and so forth, uh, had a, a thermocouple linked RF um, meter. Uh, they didn't, I, I don't think they'd figured out the thermocouple design back in these days, but uh, uh, just measuring the amperage was fine. It, it, it gave you the strongest signal that your transmitter was capable of. And, and beyond that, it doesn't really matter that much. So it was, it was a, a dual bander, if you like, the transmitter, uh, 600 meters or 500 kilohertz long ways. This was the frequency um, and everybody was on it. There was, there was no squeezing into a two or three kilohertz bandwidth because nobody could achieve that. So you were just there. And if you were loud, you were heard. And if you were not very loud, then sometimes you weren't heard. The second band was the shortwave band, quote unquote, up in the middle of our present AM broadcast band at about 930 kilohertz. And th this was new at the time. And they did discover that at night you could get amazing ranges with this even better than you could at 500. So uh, to the best of my knowledge, uh, it was certainly tested when they, they uh, ran, ran the transmitter up and, and set it up, but it was 930 kilohertz, 325 meters was never used. They, they settled on 600 meters and that's where they were for the whole trip. As I said, the signal that came out was a musical 840 hertz note. So, uh, and in those days, um, an experienced operator um, could uh, learn a lot from the sound of a signal because there was uh, German uh, machines and Danish machines and, and French and, and, and uh, Italian and, and uh, English and American. And so the different types of uh, rotary sparks and plane sparks uh, were quite distinctive once, once you were used to the, the, the system there. So you could tell a lot before the guy ever sent his, his, his call. 
So the guaranteed range from Marconi was 250 miles by day and no guarantee at night. Uh, and because by then they realized that uh, it varies a lot. It's just as we know today, if you're down on 80 or 160, that some, some nights will be great. You can, you can go, you can jump the, jump the pond and other nights you can't. Uh, now the main receiver, uh, I, I, no, no, okay, that's a pain. Let's see if I can get that. Yeah, okay. No, it doesn't work. Okay, no, that's just a darn thing showing up again. Um, so the main receiver was this Marconi multi-tuner, which I mentioned, which was a, a, a very nice design. And this Marconi magnetic detector uh, invented by Rutherford, or you had a choice. The other choice was a Fleming valve tuner and detector. And, and uh, Ambrose Fleming was a, an English, uh, uh, I'm not sure if he's a physicist or an electrical engineer or just an experimenter, but at any rate, he took uh, Edison's old design for uh, a light bulb with a plate in it and turned it into the first diode vacuum tube. And uh, uh, you would think that the diode vacuum tube would be better than the magnetic detector, but it wasn't. So every ship, every Marconi station had this as a backup, but everybody used the, the Maggie as they called it. Uh, and and this, this was, yeah, this was Rutherford's design. Uh, okay, now there's a backup, an auxiliary TX, and this was a plain spark. It used a coil very much like that one you saw just a little while ago made by the, the Marconi company. And uh, it had a charger and batteries as well. And basically this wasn't nearly as effective as the rotary. This had a guaranteed range of 40 miles as opposed to 250, but it was completely independent of the electrical system of the ship. That uh, if, if the, all the generators failed at once for whatever reason, the, the batteries were good for six to eight hours of transmission. So that was a help. There was an auxiliary receiver, which was rubbish. I don't know why they put it in. It had no tuning at all and was, was dead insensitive. If the ship was parked hundred meters from you, you could probably pick up things on it, but that was about it. But what they expected, I think, was that um, the good receiver up here would work with no power. So, you, so what you would do, and, and the, the wires were even in place in the machine, so it was easy to do you would run the auxiliary transmitter with your big main uh, uh, receiver there, the multi-tuner and the magnetic detector. The magnetic detector, by the way, you, you might think there's a, there's a, a belt of wire that, that moves around in it, but they just took an old fashioned clockwork with a big wind up key and then a little a lever you pulled out uh, to start it going or to stop it again. Okay, here, here's a look at the Titanic probably shortly before uh, uh, the ops came to install the equipment. Um, and she looks so nice and fresh there. It's kind, kind of sad in a way, but uh, there she is in Harlan and Wolf's yard. Okay, uh, there's no one schematic I could find which uh, explains how the thing worked. Well, I found one, but it was hand drawn and it would be impossible to read on this screen. So I hope you can all see this uh, well enough and uh, I'll, I'll start going through it here. So uh, the, uh, you've got DC in, this, this uh, input here is the 60 amps, which dr drives the set. The second one is merely a quite a low current to feed the field coils of the alternator. So um, there's, one, there's one big error here, which doesn't show that you see this, this is a panel uh, which has uh, this is a, a simple incandescent bulb and they're under cute brass seashells that sort of acted as a shade. You could see the, 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 the power switch, the fuses, and you could read the meters with that light. So this, this setup here monitors the, the, the current and the voltage out of the amplifier into what's called the primary circuit here. The second one, which is really there, simply mon mon monitors the uh, uh, current and voltage uh, coming from the DC mains into the motor. And, and this is another one of these uh, incandescent bulbs under a brass shield, which actually it both illuminates and it absorbs uh, certain spikes that might appear. So it, it, it's, uh, it cleans up the current a bit. Uh, I'm gonna go back to this because this is actually, a, uh, what I like about going through something like this is the cleverness. And this is a very clever device. I'll, I'll come back to it in just a moment. Uh, so we have a field rheostat for the motor and the field rheostat sets the motor's power and its speed. The speed is very important because um, the, the system is set up for 
a frequency out of the alternator of uh, uh, 420 hertz. So this, this alternator puts out 420 hertz. And the, the system, this whole, this resonance coil here, uh, there's of course uh, a couple of coils in the armature of the alternator and they're in series with the primary of the high tension transformer and of this resonance coil. And what this coil is for with a bunch of taps is just to bring the whole uh, system there into resonance at 420 uh, Hertz. And what that uh, does is it, it uh, means that there's just simple resistance through the circuit so you can get much more current through it. And the more current you get through it, the more power and a bigger and hotter spark you're going to get out of the high tension transformer here. Now you notice they put the transmit key here. So this transmit key is gonna be uh, handling uh, 17 amperes at 300 volts AC, which if you multiply it out is, is 5.1 kilowatts. And uh, that has certain implications we'll get to in, in a moment. Down here is the spark discharger. This line here is the shaft which connects them. So the, the speed of the motor is always exactly the speed of the alternator. And the shaft in fact extends, they don't show it here, to include the spark discharger. So here we have the synchronization. So, so the spark discharger studs are always moving at just the right speed to pick up the, the peaks here. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, okay, uh, and, and by the way, the output of the high tension here is uh, 14 kilovolts. Uh, I've got down 10 to 14 because if it's heavily loaded, uh, it drops the voltage a bit, but it puts out 14 kilovolts at a third of an amp. So. Uh, if you were to get across it, it would be instantly lethal, of course. And of course, you're in a ship uh, where the, the floors are iron, everything is iron, and you might be coming on duty with a, a salt-soaked uniform. So you, you want to be a bit careful. Okay, here, here's the uh, that soft motor start. As you probably know, most uh, both AC and DC motors, uh, if you immediately connect them up, especially heavier motors, uh, if you immediately connect them to the full voltage, there's an enormous current surge and it can often trip circuit breakers and, and, and also damage the motor itself or something else in the circuit. So what we have here is this is a big, this is a, uh, imagine the operator sitting in front of, uh, of the big desk in the Marconi room. Uh, he's got his key comfortably under his right hand. Uh, the whole system seems to be built for uh, non south pause, by the way. And, uh, but he can reach, just reach over, move his hand about uh, 18 inches and it falls onto that point. This point here is actually a, a little lever which comes out. And so he pulls it. And uh, it, the, minute the, uh, the minute the lever touches here, then it makes, con the, the uh, uh, armature of the motor gets current. But initially, of course, it has to go through all those resistors. So the current is low, the motor just starts to speed up and as you pull the lever back, it goes faster and faster until you're up here where it's got the full current. So this is a soft start, but there's a little more to it that the black spot there, that's a, that's a piece of soft iron, very uh, prone to being magnetized. And over on the other side here, hang on, my, my cursor keeps wanting to blink out. Um, this is an electromagnet. And when the full voltage is on and you pull the lever all the way over, then it, the electromagnetic magnet fastens on the soft iron and it stays there. So you pull it over, it latches and you're running. If for some reason, the voltage isn't sufficient coming in down here on the mains, then it won't latch. And so you know something is wrong. Or if, if there's even a fraction of a second interruption of the mains current, uh, then the electromagnet will release the handle and it snaps back over there with a thump. So you immediately know if there's a problem with your, your, your voltage feed. But beyond that, uh, and you can just try pulling it back. And, and uh, as soon as the, the, the interruption has, has been fixed or, or stops, the, it'll hold over here and, and your, your motor will run. But let's say that um, it's running nicely and there's nothing wrong with your feed. But uh, what's more likely in this system is that uh, you've got a short or sometimes the, um, the, the studs on the disk discharger will kind of burn up and, and, and they'll start drawing excessive current. Uh, if you get excessive current, um, there's another electromagnet here. And uh, uh, as the current increases above the normal, it increases its, its pull on this little plate of iron down here. The plate comes up, this, this little tapered metal thing shorts out 
the coil here, you short out this coil, and this snaps back to off. So you get a soft start, uh, a voltage failure uh, response, and a current failure response. So if anything shorts out in the radio, then this will snap off too. And they did have one problem with, with the radio uh, during the voyage. And this is, almost, I don't know this for a fact, but this is almost certainly how they, they knew it happened because all of a sudden the, the machine is singing along nicely and, and bang, the le lever flips off. And in the end, it, it turned out to be a high voltage short. So it makes, that's probably what happened. There we go. Okay, you know, here, here's what the system looks like. This is a computer graphics uh, version. Uh, the, the, you'll see a couple more pictures, uh, original pictures, but uh, they're pretty rough. They've been uh, almost certainly taken out of books and, and uh, reproduced a number of times. So this is clearer. So here's our, our motor, 12 to 15 horse motor that has to deliver seven horse uh, continuously to run the, the five kilowatt machine. Uh, the brushes are out here. Uh, they normally, there's just a uh, shield that goes over them there, but I think they're just out there so they'll be easily accessible because um, they're taking 60 amperes in and they probably have a fairly short life. So you know, the brushes are easily serviceable. Um, here's the alternator. And as you see on the solid shaft, which runs right through, it had, here's its brushes and they give you room. You can see they've made lots of room to get at the brushes and that's because both for the same reason as the motor brushes that that they're under a lot of stress and they probably wear out fairly frequently I don't know exactly but also because you can move them back and forth so they change their relationship to the commutator this of course is a segmented commutator and as you move it back and forth you'll shift the the time at which the um, sinusoidal peaks appear in the AC and here's the disc discharger inside its teak box and it's, it's a little hard to see, but the studs go across there. Anyway, so this is how you synchronize the al alignment of the studs to allow a spark to jump with the peaks in the sine wave. So this, this is here. And so this is one of the uh, tune-up adjustments that you'll make. And, and if the voltage begins to fail, as it did at the end of uh, the life of the Titanic, then this will need a little bit of retuning if it's 80 volts coming in instead of 100. And uh, in the machine here itself, these two pipes aren't pipes at all. They're the um, wires. That, and of course, this is across the 14 kilovolts. So there's 14 kV between that and that. So it's stuffed full of insulation with a wire running down the middle. And so the stud, studs over here will be, uh, let's say ground and the ones over here will be, uh, no, they're, actually they're both off ground, but anyway, there'll be 14 kV between them and the kV of course are jumping across the, the studs there. It's shown as a plain box. And I think it's because the, the guy who did it, Park Stevenson, didn't know that uh, if you took a teak box, you closed it with the, the enormous light and heat and noise out of this thing, well, especially the heat, uh, the box would be burnt up in no time. So they lined both parts of the box with lead, and then they put a, a layer on top of asbestos. And that, that seems to have done the job. The, the, the thing didn't burn up. Oops, there we go. Here's a modern one just so you can get a clearer view of what the thing looks like. You've got a, a spinning, and this is some kind of phenolic here and a, a modern just AC motor. Uh, there's a, a cooling fins down here. here. Here are your actually contacts there. And the contacts are the tungsten, which of course is a metal with a uh, very high uh, boiling point. It's, it's what's used for the filaments of incandescent bulbs in most cases, jeez. Uh, but also it's, it's a thoriated tungsten. And I think this, this is probably, I don't know for sure, but I think this is probably something that uh, uh, was, uh, they went to a physicist to, to, to uh, get this, probably Rutherford, because he, he worked on radios and for a while he held the world's record for the longest uh, received uh, radio transmission. Uh, so by thoriating, the thorium is radioactive. So they're making the, 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 uh, the gaps, the little studs there, the ends radioactive. Well, why would you do that? Well, if you put radiation through air, its breakdown voltage decreases because the, the radiation ionizes uh, um, air molecules. So by making the air more susceptible to arcing over, you could get, as the disc rotates, uh, you're not gonna wait till the two studs are perfectly lined up to get an arc. It's gonna start as one uh, uh, stud approaches the other. 
and it'll it, so it'll arc sooner if there's radioactivity there and the arc will continue longer so if this was a car you could say that you're increasing the dwell you're getting an arc for a longer time each time the two studs line up and that gives you a stronger signal Went wrong way here we go okay here's another diagram my apologies um it's pretty busy but there was no way to dissect it. This was the clearest one I could find. But this at least shows, here's the, the proper arrangement. This, this is what the uh, control uh, panel looked like in both the Olympic and the Titanic, the, the pairs. One, one for the motor input, one for the alternator output. And here's the two things. But for some reason, they put them ass backwards, that this is the uh, alternator, and it should be pointing at the rotator over here. But you see, they've, they've drawn a line too. So they're all they're on that common uh, shaft. And here you see the protection for the brushes and, and the motor. Uh, so we now have, and the, this is reproduced from the other diagram here. Here's the resonance adjustment. Here's the high tension transformer. And this is all resonant with the windings in uh, the armature of the alternator. So uh, the HT goes in, is formed to here. It passes through these two chokes and these are, exactly analogous to the plate chokes that you would get in a, in a valve uh, uh, transmitter. Uh, so uh, the 14 kV at, at uh, 420 cycles goes through is just fine, but the RF, which is generated th this, I have a little trouble here with my thing. This is known as the oscillatory circuit because uh, the, uh, the oscillations are created by the sparks that are blasting out of the uh, uh, circa the, uh, the discharger here. And uh, this thing is what's called the, uh, uh, it's an induction an inductor. It's, it's a, it's a uh, ah, for some reason my little uh, mouse wants to go. These are four tanks of capacitors. And there's a thing in the middle called a Swiss commutator. And I'll show you how it works in a minute, but uh, you can put all the capacitors in parallel and then of course you resonate at a much lower frequency. And I think that's gonna be your 500 kilohertz, or you can put them in series parallel or complete series to give you a tiny fraction of the uh, value. And that, uh, that will resonate up at 930 kilohertz, the short quote unquote short wave frequency. This is called a spiral inductance and it's got a big knob on the top. So you can basically, that's tuning the tank circuit. So you can make big changes by setting up the Swiss commutator. What it is, it's, it's, it's uh, big bars of copper. Some run vertically and some run horizontally and they have holes in them. And you have a bunch of little things which look like belaying pins, except that the long circular part is made of solid copper or brass. And so you, you put them in different combinations to make this all parallel or all series or uh, series parallel. Uh, so. Anyway, it's a simple system and you can handle high currents uh, quite safely with it. Uh, it's the ancient equivalent of the band switch of today, let's put it that way, along with spiral inductance. So here you get, so here you've got your resonant. And now the jigger is, um, what this thing has, I'll, I'll say it up front, is that the uh, link coupling was how transmitters were connected to antennas from the beginning up till mostly after World War II. Uh, I've got a bunch of old World War II radio transmitters, and they almost all use link coupling, and that's what this has. And what that means is the jigger is two uh, coils, basically hollow tubes with wire wound around the outside. One is behind, they're both behind the jigger. One is mounted to the back wall, and the other is mounted to the front. And these are taps, little studs that come through from the front coil. And the, there's two wires that come up from the oscillatory circuit. Uh, and there's a whole bunch of taps here, so you can adjust the impedance uh, to what you want. And uh, then uh, at the end here, you see that there's a dark something in one side. This is a slide. And so this, the front part with the front coil only can slide up and down. And at the end here, there's a tiny crank that, uh, this is a threaded shaft. You turn the crank and the front rises. Where it is at the bottom, the two, hollow tubular coils are on the a common axis, they're coaxial. As you raise it, they become offset. And as they become offset, the coupling is reduced. And so th this is how you do your link coupling. You, you 
you adjust the load to be optimal for the oscillatory circuit and uh, you then adjust the taps up here to take off as much power as you can to be run through uh, a loading coil and into through what's, what's called a, a Bradford standoff into the that enormous antenna overhead. The other side here, this tap is the ground tap. And so you go to, to through two what are called earth arresters and they're very clever devices too, I'll get to them in a minute, and off the ground. Now down here is the only thing in the radio that lets you know how much power you're putting out in a relative term. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll see how that works in a moment. And, and this also leads off the receiver. There's, a, there's no TR relays in this thing. These earth arresters do a very interesting job, which I'll, I'll discuss in a moment. There we go. Okay, here's an actual picture of, of the, the heavy, heavy iron in, in the uh, uh, five kilowatt uh, uh, spark transmitter. And you can see here the, the motor, uh, the alternator, and you can actually see the light you know, sort of reflecting off the shiny uh, disc discharger or spark charger. Here's the high tension transformer. It, it actually isn't potted inside, you might think. There's a, a gasketed seal and uh, you, you, so you can open it up and, and you'll see a big, uh, just massive iron and lots of, lots of wire. Here's the RF choke coils to keep the RF out of the transformer and in the oscillatory circuit. Here's the, the condensers. And here you can see the little, basically, I don't know what to call them other than uh, copper or brass belaying pins that you push in here to uh, configure the series in parallel of, of the uh, condensers. And here's your spiral inductance on top, which can be turned. Here we go. Okay, so how do you shift from transmit to receive? Well, uh, you use uh, a couple of earth arresters. And what this is, this is just, uh, I think it's nickel plated brass. And you can see this the, for countersunk screws. So it just screws onto a surface which will be firmly connected to the ship ground, which is easy enough because all the compartments are, have iron walls or at least iron walls behind some uh, light decorative coating. So um, the, Inner, the inner disc is, as I described it, the inner disc is the same material, but there's a gap there. And they've taken a disc of mica, which is about a quarter inch smaller in diameter than this inner disc. And they put it in there and they clamp it down. And uh, so you have this sort of quarter inch wide circle all the way around of a precision uh, 0.01 inch spark gap between two flat parallel surfaces. Uh, if you look up, uh, dry air, uh, the arc over voltage for uh, is about 760 volts. But this, of course, is humid sea air. And so you're probably in the two to 400 volt range. That is, if you have put a, a greater difference in voltage between these two, this will arc. So um, how is it used? Uh, well, the first thing I should say is that it might surprise you to know that this uh, 5KW transmitter uh, designed in just prior to 1910 has full QSK, full break-in. For those of you that don't use CW, it just means that between every dip and da, you're back and receive and you can hear what's going on and receive. And this was as useful back then as it is today. If somebody was desperately trying to break in with an urgent message, you, you, you could hear them when the, your key was up for a fraction of a, a, a second or a few seconds. Um, and so he, here's how the thing was set up. Here's the jigger, which we just talked about. And the tank circuit is link coupled to this. And one end of the jigger goes up, well, through the loading coil, if it's using an antenna loading coil, to the, the huge, huge antenna uh, above the ship. Uh, the other side goes to the earth arrester. So when you're transmitting, uh, the, you've got uh, you know, a lot of current, a lot of voltage going in here. And it jumps over this tiny gap in here with virtually no loss. And so essentially it's, it's an effective ground anytime you decide to transmit. However, when the key goes up, it is again an open circuit for the receiver, which isn't going to, to put any, any uh, voltage on it. So it works very nicely as a receiver. It also acts to protect the receiver because a half mile of air of uh, antenna that high in the air You've all heard of St. Elmo's fire. There's a lot of, there can be a tremendous amount of static electricity, 
So uh, this uh, this will drain off the static. Anything you know, and static gets up into the thousands of volts. So this is a very effective way of keeping high voltage static out of the receiver where it might might damage something. And uh, there's another part to this too, which I'll get to in a moment. But uh, the what else I want to say? Yeah, that's about it. So this this was uh, zero moving parts. They worked very well, uh, and you had instant. Uh, transfer back and forth between transmit and receive. Uh, okay, uh, this is just, uh, remember I talked about the uh, uh, 17 amperes at 300 volts. So your key was actually uh, uh, transmitting and not transmitting uh, 5.1 kilowatts, which is a heck of a lot to go through a little, little a Morse key contact. Um, so this is this is a relay. It's, it's, it's actually there's nothing magic about it. Just a, a relay with a big stout contact on the other side there that'll handle the 5.1 kilowatts with no problem. And then your actual, you know, government post office Morse key uh, was only uh, have, having to uh, control the uh, solenoid current, which is probably a fraction fraction of an amp at a few volts. Uh, this gadget up here is how they were able to, to, to see how much power they were putting out, how they were able to peak it. They couldn't, they couldn't put a number in watts, but all it is is a little light bulb. And <clears throat> this isn't a coil, it's actually just a, a rheostat. And this would be put in parallel with the length of the wire going to ground uh, from the jigger. And uh, actually here it is down here. This is a picture from the Olympic and there's this device. And uh, so, uh, it's, it's basically a, sh a shunted ammeter. And so as you tune the thing up, you'll start to see some, uh, the light will start to glow dimly. And as you get everything, it'll glow brighter and brighter. And all this thing does is you move it around to make sure that at the maximum current out, uh, you've got a bright lamp, but not so bright you're going to burn it out. So it's just adjusting the lamp to the current that it's, is going to be developed. And so you, whatever you do, you just watch that little bulb. Uh, well, I remember the first time I used a transmitter, I took a 60 watt uh, standard light bulb and I, and I hooked it up and yeah, it worked pretty well. You, you could easily, easily peak all the circuits to get the maximum power out. So that's, that's how they did it, pretty basic. And here's the earth arrestor in service here uh, against the wall of, of the uh, Marconi room in the uh, Olympic. Uh, here's the tuner, the big, big receive tuner that C.S. Franklin developed uh, in uh, 1907. Uh, he, he was a, he worked for Marconi too. And uh, Marconi, <clears throat> actually, this was quite famous back in the day that it was called the, the, the four sevens patent. And uh, this was Marconi basically stated that the tuning was essential for proper radio operation. And he had a series of, of, of circuits which would do it, but none were as sophisticated as this. This, uh, this basically is, is a tuner that goes from uh, 2000 to uh, uh, excuse me, 2,600 meters to 80 meters. So 120 kilohertz to 3.5775 megahertz. And it's a four bander. You see this gang switch on the front with four little buttons of so the, the little contacts the way they used to do it. And so uh, you would switch that to the, the right band. Uh, you had a very elaborate antenna matching system here with many, many studs. You can match the, the antenna exactly to the, the uh, uh, tuner. Uh, this is a micro spark gap that the little neural knob comes to a sharp point in there and you peer in there and you set it to wherever you and can be just a, again, a fraction of a, an inch, a hundredth of an inch or even less. Uh, and it would spark at a hundredth of an inch faster than the earth arrestor because it, it comes to a point. The point uh, needs lower voltage to develop a spark on a flat surface. <clears throat> and uh, on top here, these are simple, uh, we, uh, they were unusual at the time, but they're certainly not today. Air variable capacitors, they're shielded in this case. The top is inscribed with uh, an arbitrary numbering system and the, there's a little uh, brass point. So you can log and you can reset them very closely. And there's three tuned circuits in here. And at the end here, this knob uh, adjusts the coupling. And here's, you, you turn the thing up on its side, have a look underneath. And so here's the coupling. And it's what we would call a goniometer to wire wound on a, a hollow sphere uh, uh, on a shaft. So you turn this, this is maximum coupling when, when the, the turns on the primary and the secondary are in parallel. As you turn this, of course, it sort of turns in. When you get it turned to full 90 degrees, you have almost no coupling. So you can go from high coupling to no coupling. 
thing needs a little repair. Uh, maybe you should send it back to Marconi there. It's only 120 years old. Uh, this has simply come loose. It, it, it was almost the wire was varnished on originally and it's come loose there. It should look like that. So this is uh, coupling circuits. And so you can go from very light coupling, which gives you good selectivity, but poor sensitivity and uh, very heavy coupling, which gives you good sensitivity and poor selectivity. But it actually made sense to have all that range because if ships were close to you, uh, there was no automatic gain control in the, these radios. And so if a ship uh, broadcast and was only 20 or 30 miles away, it could, with an antenna like the Titanic's, it, it, uh, the operator would usually take the headphones off and put them five or six feet away where it was comfortable and, and uh, then, then copy the code. So when you got this horrible blast, you could uh, make the thing very selective and, and turn down the coupling. And so it was a, a both a crude volume control and a way to get it very selective so you wouldn't be bothered by nearby signals. Whoops. Hang on, I didn't mean to do that. Come on, go away. Well, this is a pain. Oh. Yeah, I can get rid of it. Next. Okay. No, it's not going to do anything. Okay. Oh, dear. Well, that's a pain. May have to live with that. Yeah. Go to slide. I don't know what it's going to do. Uh, go to slide. Anything? Nothing. <laughs> okay. I'm sorry about that, folks. I really don't know how. Get rid of it. Oh, I have to do something because I, I can't advance the slides now. Ah, uh, my apologies. How the heck do I do this? Oh, oh there it is. Don't, don't, don't ask me why it went away, but, ah, okay, good, here we go. Okay, so this is a schematic. Uh, I'm not gonna spend time other than to say that um, there's a, a switch up here. There's there's three tuned circuits, this cap, this coil, and uh, the part of this which is engaged with the antenna, this, this uh, impedance match here, uh, are tunable by this capacitor. This capacitor tunes the, this. This is link coupling again. They loved their link coupling back in the day. And uh, this one tunes this final one here. Up top here, you have a choice. Uh, the detector is in the middle, and if you switch over here to, they call it standby, but this is basically, you're using just a single tuned circuit and the detector, and the, the signal comes out of the detector to the headphones. Or if you go over here to tune, then you can, you can use all three circuits and the attenuation and the coupling and so forth. So you have a choice there. Uh, yeah, that's about it. I, I've said most of this. But, but compared to anything else that was available. So this was used not just with Marconi equipment, but apparently they were bought for, uh, for many other systems and many other ships. And uh, these were very popular from uh, when they came out in 1907 till um, after this first world war in 18 and 19, when things started to go to vacuum tubes. But uh, so I thought that might not be too expensive. I, I would love to get hold of one of these and, and try to get some numbers and how selective it was and, and how lossy it was. But I looked around and I did find one for sale, but they wanted $50,000 for it. So I thought, well, maybe I'll, I'll stifle my curiosity. Now here's the magnetic detector, that Rutherford's little, little invention. And uh, I'll say one thing's wrong with this right away. You see the green wire there. This is a fine stranded soft iron wire covered with uh, green silk, the sort of thing they used back in the day. Uh, and it goes through, there's two coils here. One's wrapped around a little glass tube, which you can just see there. And the other's wound around this larger bobbin in the middle. And you can see two magnets there. So the thing is given a magnetic bias and then you, the, the signal comes in. And uh, uh, what, what uh, uh, was said at the time, uh, was that it has asymmetric hysteresis, uh, uh, which doesn't mean a lot to most people. But what, it, what, what happened was that 
uh, the wire was mildly magnified, or excuse me, magnetized. And uh, when a signal went on, the one in one direction from zero, the signal would increase the magnetism because it was coming. The signal actually went in on, on the big bobbin in the middle there. It would increase the magnetism. And when in the other direction, it would decrease it. So uh, essentially that could be played back. It was actually, it was, this is the, the uh, antecedent of the wire recorder, which was widely used in World War II. Uh, and there's another set of magnets in the back, so that would erase it. So you had to erase it each time. If you, if you just did one cycle and you took this off, you actually, they didn't do this because they didn't have a playback mechanism, but you, you could. That the, what it, it, it took it a couple of minutes to go around and, and you had a couple of minutes of recorded uh, uh, Morse code. The box itself is, is just a big clockwork mechanism. And uh, I, I can't tell it now because I don't have time, but uh, it, it played a critical role uh, in uh, the, the Titanic, the human Titanic story. But anyway, this, this was the detector. And uh, uh, yeah, I'm not gonna spend too much time on this, but it, was, uh, it worked very well. And here is a telephone. This is the old earpiece. I'm sure you remember from the, the wall sets uh, where you turned a crank, a little magneto to get the phone and you listened in one of these. Anyway, um, they worked very well and they were more sensitive and more reliable than the, the, this, the uh, Fleming diodes. There was, there's a number of reasons for that. I won't go into it other than they didn't know about putting bias in a diode to increase its sensitivity, uh, judging from the circuit. And uh, they had did two adjustments. One uh, adjusted the filament uh, current and the other adjusted the plate voltage. But they, that, that didn't really affect the sensitivity of them. Anyway, the original Fleming valves were bayonet. You can see the original here. And then the, this person has put adapters in. And these are VT tubes, old World War I US Army diodes, I guess. I don't know if they're any better or not. It had two tuning stages. You can actually see the top of one of these uh, condensers, as they call them, the aerial tuning condenser and the intermediate tuning condenser. And so you've got your, your log scale here and your little pointer there and there's a lock on it, so you can put it in a certain position. And uh, remember, and here's, here's the micro spark gap, just like the triple tuner. And you read it there, Marconi Wireless Telegraph, uh, uh, London, patent applied for. Anyway, they, uh, they did work. And when diodes uh, and our understanding of diodes improved, then of course, diode detectors became, became the thing. Now, you probably have all seen these uh, uh, government post office keys, that they, there was a variety of different models. And, and I wouldn't be surprised if you hadn't seen a key which has all this hardware on it. They're known as a gu guillotine key. And uh, uh, if, if I had a live audience in front of me, I'd, I'd ask the question, what's it for? Uh, at least on this side of the pond, not many people know. But what it is, is remember that 17 amps, uh, 300 volts, 5.1 kilowatts? Well, that's all going through those little points. And so it was not unusual at all to be in the middle of a QSO and the points would weld together. And uh, the Spark machine was not a 100% duty cycle. It was a very low duty cycle. If, if, if you didn't do anything, you went off for the, a cup of tea while you thought about it, then you'd burn up your Spark uh, disk discharger for sure, maybe the high tension transformer, and maybe burn all the brushes out of the motor and the, and the alternator. So uh, the... Uh, the guillotine, you just yanked it up quick. You see, the, the guillotine is part of the, the, the basic circuit of the key. So you just yank it up and the uh, your, your key's off and then you can deal with this. And I, I believe on these, the, the uh, contacts are replaceable. So you just put in a new set of contacts and then you were away again. Now there's another, uh, there's another thing here. And this is actually a second little key that goes down when you depress the main button. And uh, I'll get to that in a minute. In fact, I'm getting to it uh, uh, right now. This is a part, as you can see, this is an original schematic and I did my best to make it as clear as I could. It, it leaves a lot to be desired, I know. But uh, here's the, uh, the 17 amp 300 volt line from the alternator. And what they, what they did, uh, I, I don't know if they tried it first without it, but they said, this is ridiculous. We'll put in a proper relay. So they put this relay, which you saw a little while ago, so that the, the, uh, the Morse key is only taking a light current. So the, the, the uh, guillotine key isn't used much. But there's another thing here, and that is that 
I don't know if you've thought about it yet, but uh, what happens when you go key down transmit and you've got the headphones on? Um, <laughs> because the receiver is across this little earth arrester spark gap here and isn't that going to put a, a god awful noise on the headphones? Well, yes, it would, but the second little key, which depresses uh, synchronously with this one because it has a little lever that goes under the, 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 uh, the bar here, uh, shorts out the two wires, M and M. And what do the wires go to? They go across the headphones. So the instant you go to transmit, you short out the headphones and your, your ears aren't, aren't barraged. And so here's the triple tuner, here's the, the Maggie. And of course the Maggie is the detector is the final part and it goes into your, excuse me, head telephones. And uh, I noticed here, there's another little thing, another bit of cleverness. And you see key, dry cell, shunted buzzer. Well, what's all this about? Well, what it's about is uh, you sit down before you start operating and you'd like to do a quick check. Is your receiver receiving? Is the magnetic detector working? You, you would first pull a little knob out there so that the, the wire started to uh, move along. And you put the headphones on and uh, you press this little key, which has nothing to do with sending signals to other ships. And the little buzzer starts. It's like the, uh, I think it's like one of those uh, cheap doorbell buzzers, which it generates a little spark across a gap there. and the signal is picked and the dry cell powers it. And uh, it's picked up uh, by the receiver and uh, also by the detector. If the detector isn't working right, you'll hear nothing because the detector isn't working. Um, you can't, this doesn't allow you to sharply tune this, but if it's tuned approximately correctly, then you'll get a, a certain level of sound here, which you'll get used to. In other words, it should sound about this loud if the uh, detector and the multi-tuner are working. So it gives you a, uh, just a quick, cheap, simple, you know, uh, three, two or three second check on whether, because there's a lot of controls on this too. There, there's a number of other switches and so forth that uh, um, if somebody left it uh, in, in not the condition you expected, then uh, you wouldn't get any sound out of it. So, so anyway, this is just a little uh, way to check. Now, um, I didn't find any way to produce a side tone, but I think that makes very good sense. Why? Because uh, even with the heavy wooden walls and the, 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 uh, the, the teak box, uh, you're gonna hear that, that uh, disc discharger roaring in the next room, but through all that uh, damping, it's gonna be fairly soft. So uh, your side tone is just going to be, you're gonna hear the burp, 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 burp from the disc discharger uh, from the next room, from the silent room, which isn't quite silent. Here's the, this, I wish I could say this was the Titanic, but it's not, it's the Olympic. The, uh, the I, I forget if I said, but the blueprint, a single blueprint was used for the Titanic and the Olympic. So they're, they're virtually identical out of a few little quirks like this. In the Olympic, the first one, they put, they put it on the side of the ship with a window. Uh, and that's fine and nobody minded that, but uh, somebody, I guess, probably in the accounting department said, do you realize what we're charging for a top deck stateroom with a window? And actually what they were charging in 1912 for the, the trip across the Atlantic, one way, stateroom on the top floor with a window was 4,600 US dollars, which in today's money is hundred about $117,000 for, for one way across the Atlantic. Uh, in 1912. Uh, so they said, why are we uh, wasting that space on the radios? So in the Titanic, the radio was put in the middle of the ship, right along the, the center line over the keel. And uh, the, in the Titanic, they got a skylight. Here they just got, a, got the window. Uh, even here, there's something interesting. Uh, they may look like clocks, but they're not. They're what, what they called magneta. And, and these are a remote slave clocks. There was only two clocks in the Titanic and they were both on the bridge and the rest of the ship had these slave clocks. And one is going to be ship's time. And remember at this time, there was no international time zones. So the time on the Titanic, if you try to sort out exactly the sequence of events in the catastrophe, it's a real pain because uh, a lot of it's based on telegrams or Marconigrams sent between ships and on each ship, they had a different time. If the ship was 200 miles behind you, then it would be some minutes different in time because uh, it was local. 
and the other clock is, is going to be either UTC or it may be that by this point they switched them to uh, New York time, I don't know. But anyway, um, so this is this was the time, the uh, Olympic. And here you see the, the meter panel. This is actually the charger for the, what they called accumulators, the batteries, which were there as a backup to power this, the plain spark uh, uh, inductor down here. Here are the two fields for the motor and the alternator. And here's that, that lovely uh, soft start uh, voltage current, uh, 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 basically it's sort of a circuit breaker. It's, it's a, you call it a circuit breaker. Uh, here's the, the Maggie, here's the triple tuner, here's the, um, what you call it, uh, diodes, uh, Fleming diodes. I could tell because those two things in the front, they were the rheostats to adjust the, the filament current on the two, two diodes there. And here's, uh, oh, here's another thing that uh, these things here are actually, uh, I don't know if in England you had as many, but over here, way back in the day, uh, most big stores had a pneumatic system and you've got little cylinders and uh, you bought an item, you can't, went to the front, they, they wrote you up a bill, it went into the cylinder, went up to the accounting office, it might be two stories above or down in the cellar or somewhere. They would process it, uh, put in your change, send back the stamped receipt. And uh, they used the system here. These went, they're the to and from to the chief purser. Uh, one thing which was really a mistake was that there was no direct connection, neither telephone nor speaking tube, nor uh, um, uh, air system to deliver messages between the bridge and the uh, radio room. So Captain Smith and Harold Bride, the assistant uh, operator, did a lot of running back and forth between the bridge and the radio room to delay, to uh, transfer information that should have been gotten immediately. So uh, anyway, that, uh, that changed in, in subsequent ships. And uh, here's of course the operating desk, the, the power supply over here for the, the, uh, the Fleming valves. Uh, and there's the earth arrester, there's your little uh, power light uh, and, and so on. And uh, okay. And here, here's the same one with an operator in place uh, on the Olympia, Olympic. <laughs> and you can see that uh, actually uh, it's a posed picture because he's supposedly filling in a Marconi gram form with his earphones on, but the knife switches are all pulled, so nothing is nothing is running. Here's the one and only photograph of the uh, Titanic's uh, radio room, and it it was uh, only sort of survived because the the chap who took it actually I think it was a minister, and he got off at uh, uh, Queenstown, Ireland. That was the last stop the Titanic made. It went down to Southampton and crossed to Cherbourg, back to Southampton where it picked up all its coal and food and passengers. And then it just stopped at Queenstown. A few people got off. Uh, wise decision by this fellow to get off. Anyway, it's a double exposure. Uh, and we see the back of Harold Bride, uh, but we don't see this wall. So when James Cameron went to make the movie, uh, he assumed that because they're made from the same blueprint, uh, that the uh, Titanic would have had that all that the same equipment on this wall that the Olympic did. That wasn't the case. Here, here's the movie uh, from the movie, and you can see that he set this up, and it's a it's a pretty good reproduction. Like I can see because I've looked at it so much that the dimensions aren't they aren't right on on the triple tuner and anyway, but you know that's nitpicking. Uh, but it's it they did a good job, but. What they put, and Cameron didn't know it at the time, he only found out when he went down a deep diving submersible to look at the real Titanic. And he discovered that none of this stuff was it. Actually, the only thing which was here was the, the soft start system there. And this was very handy because as I said, so you're sitting there in your chair, you're operating the key, the, the thing kicks off, or maybe you're just starting up and you pull on that handle and uh, everything, all this stuff is in the other room in the Titanic. Here's, uh, again, this is another uh, computer graphics thing that this, you just look at and you know it's not a real picture because uh, where was the light and what on earth kind of light would light up this much? Because it's, it's pretty darn dark down there. It, it's, uh, it's, it, the Titanic's in 12,500 feet of water, which I just I calculated for the fun of it. And that's uh, just under 5,500 pounds per square inch pressure. 
Uh, so you don't go down there with a snorkel or a scuba outfit. And it's three degrees C. And the, uh, you see all this decoration, quote unquote, on the outside here. These are rusticles. And the Titanic is being destroyed, literally eaten up by uh, microbes, bacteria, which uh, gain the energy to live by oxidizing the iron into iron salts, like iron sulfide and iron chloride and so forth. And uh, so the ship is just crumbling away. It's not, it's not traditional corrosion. Uh, this is the Alvin, which is a deep diving submersible that's been coming out of Woods Hole Oceanographic for, I remember I lived on Cape Cod and, and Woods Hole is down there. And this was, uh, uh, this was purchased initially back in the 60s and it's done an enormous amount of really interesting deep sea research. So it's down here with, uh, you see this umbilicus and then there's a tiny gadget down here. And this is the ROV, remote operated vehicle. And all the pictures that you'll see of the inside were taken by an ROV, the, the Alvin's ROV and, and uh, uh, quite a number of other deep diving submersibles have been down here. Alvin is sitting right over the uh, Marconi rooms. As matter of, this square here is the skylight in the, the, the center top of the uh, operator's room. So the, the bunks are over here and the silent room is, is in here. And here's, here's what Cameron saw and said, oh, we got it wrong. This is the silent room. The, the walls have dissolved away, but here's the, uh, the instruments, the controls up on the wall. And they didn't dissolve away because there's so much copper in them. Copper uh, salts are toxic to the bacteria that digested the wood and, and the iron around. So that, that's still standing. But, <coughs> excuse me. Here's the motor. There, there's the lift ring on the, the DC motor. Here's the alternator. You can see the long open snout there with the lift ring. And here's the teak box, which is still there, has still survived, and is open. And uh, the question is, is it open because Bride was fiddling with the field adjustments here to keep the spark up as the voltage started to fall off as the ship sank? Or did it open? And that's what everybody says, and it sounds really romantic. But uh, if he closed it again, uh, it, uh, it would have had a big bubble of air inside. And so when the, the ship sank, the bubble probably would have pushed it open. I don't know. Here's the Swiss commutator and the capaci capacitor banks down here. <clears throat> and you can actually see there was the four gauges up there at, at the top. So all this gear was installed in the silent room instead of in the operator's room on the Titanic. So Cameron got it wrong. This is a, a CG image uh, of uh, what they think it really looked like. So this is going into the operator's room. Uh, they've got duct boards down here. Here's, you can actually have a rather good view of the Swiss commutator here. Uh, and here's the MG set and the spiral inductance. There would have been more wires than they're showing here, but I guess they, yeah, anyway, they did, just didn't put them in. As a matter of fact, you can see from, oh, by the way, if I go back there, um, yeah, this is all mostly supported by the heavy wires that are going down. And uh, it's, uh, there would have been a lot more wires than they show in that. Well, they put in, I guess, what they had some idea was correct. But uh, there it is. And this would be much clearer, uh, except that there's a fine, fluffy sediment inside the Titanic, which isn't carried away by currents, because there aren't many currents in there. Uh, and if you could somehow blow it or vacuum it off, you'd see everything much more clearly. But if you, if you disturb it when you go in there, uh, then you don't see anything at all. You just have murk. So uh, you have to sneak in very carefully and, and uh, get your pictures. Uh, there is one sometime uh, at, at another time. Here it is. Here, here's the, uh, the meter. This is the voltmeter for the motor. And at this point, it's been blown off. Uh, the glass is still intact in it. And actually, you can see there's growth on this, so you can't see very exactly, but the, the lettering inside is still quite nice and clear. And you see the light is shining from what remains of the uh, Marconi room. The Marconi room, well, I'll, I'll finish this. Here, here's a, another a recreation of the uh, you know, disk discharge operation. And uh, this Park Stevenson did it. Uh, he, he, he was one of the fellows who went down one of the deep diving submersibles there. <clears throat> I, I'm, uh, I, I don't want to badmouth anybody, but he has, uh, there's, there's a fair amount of misinformation about this 
in, in some of the things that he's, he's put out. Anyway, that, I've said it. Uh, this is, is empty, but in fact, if you look here, you can see that's probably the lead lining down in there that we're seeing. But as I say, it was lined with lead and, and asbestos. <clears throat> Here's one of the, uh, uh, I guess, blown off, one of the uh, uh, rheostats. I don't know if, it, if it's the uh, uh, motor field or the alternator field, but there's, there's the rheostat. And this would be in the position where it was last touched and, and adjusted by uh, Harold Bride on his, on his way out. Uh, and here's the way. It, now, this is a later picture, and I'm a little concerned that uh, I don't see the uh, disc discharger box down there anymore. This wall is pretty well gone away. There, there's the, the spiral inductance. It's fallen off because <laughs> there's no more wall. And I'm not sure if this mess is actually these controls now, but uh, it, the, the Titanic has undergone tremendous deterioration since it was first found in the 80s by Robert Ballard. <clears throat> uh, th this is nice because I think it's mostly correct and uh, you really get a look at, at what the silent room was like. Uh, the duct boards, I don't know if they have proof that they were there, but they make very good sense because teak duck, teak is one of the woods that if you use it as a deck, uh, it doesn't get slippery when it's, when it's saturated with seawater. It's much better than most woods. And as a matter of fact, years ago, I was on the uh, Missouri, the, the, the battleship that the uh, surrender of Japan was signed in Tokyo Harbor. And it's uh, got, of course, an enormous piece of deck up on the bow. And it's all teak wood uh, because the sailors could run quickly when necessary, not slip and fall. Uh, anyway, so you, you pretty well know the gear now. Here, here's a, a rather nicer view of the jigger. And you can see how it can move up and down there. There's your antenna loading. I don't know. The antenna either came out up here or I suspect on this side in the Marconi room. Uh, and of course, buckets of sand would have been the thing to have in those days. There was no CO2 or foam fire extinguishers. You didn't want to throw water on the, this, let's say, with the 14,000 volts going through it. So sand was the thing to use in the case of fire. There's the, there's the batteries for the backup. Uh, uh, tuner. And this is uh, what is left in the, uh, the Marconi room. What happened to the Marconi room is uh, it's almost over the grand staircase, which you may remember from the Cameron movie. <clears throat> and so the water filled this room before it filled the room below. So uh, there was, you know, I don't know how many hundred tons of water would fit into the Marconi room, but it, it basically ripped the room away and, and all the, the, most of the desk and all its nice uh, radio contents cascaded down the grand staircase to be somewhere way down deep in the ship, uh, not to be found. So the people that want to bring up the radio from the Titanic, the best they can do if it doesn't fall apart on top of them is, is get out the, the motor generator set. This is a coil spring from the desk. The desk was mounted on coil springs because throughout the boat, of course, there was a fine vibration from those enormous motors in the, in the, in the stern. And so they put the desk on four big coil springs so that it was a perfectly uh, still surface. It was easy to write Marconi grams on and it was easy to send Morse on. So, you know, if you do an evaluation, how did the system work? Uh, Marconi guaranteed 250 miles a day, uh, the use, and they sent hundreds of messages for the passengers. It was, it was ironic that uh, it was all trivial stuff, you know, that uh, somebody would call back uh, call back to London to, to remind the butler to feed the cat, this sort of thing. And, and this is what, well, I don't want to get into the human story, but it exhausted the operators because when the, when the disaster came, they, they'd been up for about 48 hours with no sleep. At night, uh, when they were testing off uh, Northern Ireland, <clears throat> they were able to get solid contacts with Tenerife in the Canaries and Port Said on the Suez Canal, 2,600 miles. Uh, so. At night, <clears throat> on, on many nights, I don't know what percentage, that that, that rig uh, was pretty darn effective. And this is also amazing from the receive side. So the, again, they were hearing clearly uh, energy sent from Port Said in the passive receiver. Hundreds of messages were sent. And then when they got close enough, they switched over to Cape Race. And, uh, so on, on, there was one failure of the radio and that was on 13th of April. And uh, there was a short uh, and it turns out 
that it was in the, there's the, the 14 kilovolt wires, as you might expect, had fat rubber coatings. And uh, they looked and looked and couldn't find the short, but uh, the uh, uh, soft start wouldn't reset, which told them there was a current overload and the meter told them that too. Um, and they discovered, they eventually found that they had to open the uh, high tension transformer box and they found the short inside the box. So uh, it, it, anyway, it took all night and uh, they were back in operation in the morning of the 14th, but of course they hit the iceberg uh, at just about midnight, a little, a little bit uh, below 11.15 and they, they were exhausted. And so certain mistakes were made uh, and some of them were very dependent on the operating procedure that Marconi had instituted. Anyway, that's a whole other story. Uh, so after they struck the bird, they had good communications with at least 12 ships and were copied by at least 28 stations, uh, which is pretty darn good. Uh, anyway, they were uh, finally heard. And uh, how effective were they? They mixed up CQD and SOS. Uh, and uh, uh, Bride suggested to, to, to uh, Jack Phillips that he try it. He'd been sending CQD, but uh, he said, uh, why don't you try SOS? This might be your last chance. And they laughed at it. And it was uh, Phillips' last chance. So they sent both. Uh, they were heard easily at Cape Race and Sable Island, which is 90 miles east of uh, Halifax, uh, and also down in Sias Consett, which isn't actually is in Massachusetts. It, it's Nantucket Island, south of, of uh, Cape Cod. Uh, and Seagate, New York at 1,255 miles. So I guess my conclusion is that despite having no amplifiers and the Marconi five kilowatt synchronous rotary spark transmitter and the receiver were very well designed and gave excellent service for both routine and emergency comms. And uh, certainly <coughs> the Titanic 710 survivors owe their, owe their <coughs> lives to that radio. And that's it. And that's it folks. Brilliant. Lovely. Thank you very much indeed, Fred. Um, <laughs> goodness me, what a lot of information in that uh, in that talk. So uh, thank you for talking us through that in wonderful detail. Um, you know, we I, I guess we all had some concept of a, 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 a spark transmitter being very simple. It is at one level, but actually you showed us there's, there's quite a lot to it. Um, I'm just going to stop the sharing so we can see all the, um, the videos on the cameras and uh, we'll right. throw it open for um, uh, people who want to ask any questions or make any comments. So who wants to go first? I put you if all I don't see, if I don't see you wave, if I don't see you wave, then uh, just unmute and dive in. OK. Uh... John Howells, is that you? Yeah. Yeah, you know, I, I, I thought it was a great presentation. Yeah, I enjoy, enjoyed it all the way through. It, uh, okay, thank you. And uh, one thing that comes to uh, came to mind was uh, the equipment they use is nothing at all like they use now. <laughs> well, that's it. It's uh, I think of it, it was like the age of dinosaurs. They started with this simple device from Hertz, and the engineers got at it and people who really wanted it to work better got at it. And they made an incredible... What that was. Anyway, and, and so it rose to this peak of quite a bit of sophistication. And, and then it was thrown away because tubes came along and amplifiers came along. Anyone else with anything? Anyone else with a question, comment to Fred? <coughs> I, yeah, I go, on, go, go on, Ken. Ken, go on. Well, it's not so much a question. Can you hear me? Oh, you're roaring <laughs> in. Five okay. plus 90 dBs, Ken. Yeah. <laughs> you're like the spark discharger. Okay. Um, I'll soften my voice a bit. It's not a question. There's more an observation. And that is sort of after about 10 minutes when you were explaining about the antennas of which I'm quite very much involved in having made antennas, built them and, and, and understanding them. 
But you know when you described the antenna initially, did you say it was like a T antenna, top loaded? It looked, that's what I'm, it looked like with the, the wires across the top and the three wires coming down, like it was a top loaded, what we call a top loaded T antenna. Yeah, it's uh, actually, it was two twin T antennas. There was in fact four separate uh, T's up there and uh, it was shorter than you would expect for resonance at 900 kilohertz because, of course, those uh, great four great T's at the top have a capacity loading. Absolutely. Oh. Yes, but what I was my observation being that it's working like a quarter wave vertical, even though it's actually shorter than it. And obviously, it's got its perfect ground plane being the C, which yeah. means that the frequency of 600 meters 500 kilohertz yeah yeah or 325 meters uh i think for the 600 meters it was it was obviously a much shorter aerial whereas it's nearer to 325 but i was trying to work out the propagation effect at 325 when you're using a vertical aerial over the sea which would have given very low angle of radiation. And then I start to think that when he was giving his CQD call, yeah. I'm wondering how many local ships, when I mean local, I mean within say 100 miles or 200 miles, would have picked the signal up because he's using antennas that are more for DX, long distance, unbeknown to them probably in, in the very early part of the 1900s where um and would they have been better had we had they known now when they were in the 21st century they probably would have used totally different types of aerials for that frequency and oh. probably something more horizontal well I, i'm sure i'm sure you're right ken but uh I, I don't think I mentioned there was another advantage of that antenna, and that was it had quite substantial gain along the long axis of the ship. And they could tell us, of course, because they had a, a time mm. signal station, which Britain had in those days. As the ship swung around, they could hear the, the, it, uh, consistently the, the, the amplitude of the received signal would rise. Yeah. But, um, yeah, it's, it's a good question. Would they have been better with something else? But the... Uh, uh, the fact that they had all that capacity over the deck made it much easier to load and resonate at uh, 500 kilohertz. And this was, a, if you look at pictures of the old uh, uh, amateur radio setups of the day, uh, a lot of them would have this multiple wires, four or six wires in parallel above the ground. And it was the same thing because the, um, amateurs started off with those old crude spark rigs at about 100 or 150 kilohertz. And so... Uh, at 150 kilohertz, a half wave dipole is a kilometer long, which is a bit rough for the, unless you've got a, an extraordinary garden. And uh, so uh, they'd use multiple wires and then they basically the percent efficiency of the antenna would rise. And just as I understand what you're saying, and just as an add on to that, it was in the early hours of the morning when they hit the iceberg. Right. Um, if I'm right. Well, it was, they, they hit at 11.50 just before midnight, but it took them two and a half hours to sink. Right. So at night time, when the uh, propagation is lengthened for that frequency, no wonder Port Said was picking them up over in Egypt or wherever it is, whereas that's a pretty useless for them in the middle of the Atlantic which only confirms what I'm saying. If they'd have had a simple inverted V, they probably would have got heard a lot quicker. I'm not saying an inverted V because for that frequency, it's probably far too short anyway. But what I'm saying is something more horizontal. But I know what you're saying about the gain of it. Um, it's just that being heard at Port Said when they're in the middle of the Atlantic and there's a boat only 20 miles away, who didn't pick them up for any number of reasons. I just think what a sad state, what a sad situation it was. Well, actually, you're probably referring to the Californian 
Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, it was only 11 miles away. Uh -huh. And they could, they could actually see the Titanic. And the Titanic was stopped, of course, after hitting the iceberg. The Titanic sent up a whole series of rockets because they could see the lights of the Californian 11 miles away. Yes, but didn't, didn't they think that they were having a party or something? <laughs> well, there's a, a bunch of sad coincidences that uh, there was this uh, Cyril, uh, what was his name? Uh, Cyril Groves, I think, was the operator on the, the Californian, but they only had one operator because two operators weren't required by law. So he'd been going for 14 hours and he went to bed exhausted uh, 20 minutes before the CQD came out of the Titanic. Oh, but, all right. But the crew saw the rockets going off and they saw the ship uh, uh, quite easily about 11 miles away. So they called the captain up. And the captain crawled out of his bunk and came up, Captain Lord. And uh, he said, uh, they said, it must be an emergency. And he looks over and he says, that doesn't look like the right shape for the Titanic it's, or a, a big liner. I don't know what it is, but it's not a big liner. And uh, they're probably just having a party. And, and so... Yeah. He went back to bed, and uh, the uh, what it turned out that a lot of people have, have gone through that. And I read quite a, a scholarly paper by a bunch of meteorologists, and it turns out that there's something called cold water mirages, just as there are hot mirages over a desert. So um, the uh, Titanic was close to all these icebergs and was very cold, and so essentially the captain didn't recognize it as a liner because the image was was badly distorted. But he could have called uh, the, the uh, wireless operator out of, out of bed and put him back on just to check to see if there was any distress calls or to call the ship and find out if everything was all right. He didn't. He didn't bother. And so he wasn't convicted of anything. As you probably know, there was a British inquiry and there was an American inquiry. And he wasn't convicted of anything. But people, the way they put it was that his career was blighted because people yeah. really didn't feel that you know, at sea, you must come to assistance, and he, he didn't. Yeah, yeah. That's that, that antenna system that they had got on that boat is every radio amateur's dream oh, at yeah. a smaller yeah. scale. I, I think because, it's, was, because it's brilliant for DX. Yeah. But yeah. well, the other thought, thing I think that there was a belief at the time that you know the more wire you had in the air, the better it would be when you didn't have amplifiers because yeah. you couldn't compensate for a little antenna with an amplifier because you didn't have one. And so the half mile of heavy bronze wire, they thought, well, that's going to pick up a lot. And it, it did. But uh, I'm sure you're right that with today's understanding, I mean, they didn't understand how antennas worked entirely back then. This is, uh, mm -hmm. we've come a long way since 1912. <laughs> yeah. yeah, thank you, Ken. Thanks, Fred. Uh, Jim, N9EET. Yeah, good afternoon. Can you hear me okay? We can, uh, good yeah. Good afternoon, Jim. Just fine. Good afternoon. A brilliant talk. Two things. When did when did uh, CW start to be used for communications? And when did they start to migrate to frequencies, uh, for instance, from 3 to 30 megacycles that would have had smaller antennas? Oh, well, actually, one of the consequences of it was, of course, that the International Tele Telecommunications Union, the ITU, actually had been around since the 1860s because they coordinated uh, Morse code between the 30 odd countries of Europe. I mean, before that, people were on with code, but the Czechs didn't speak the same as the Russians and didn't speak the same as the Germans. So uh, the ITU was planning to meet sometime in the near future, but because of the Titanic, they got together in the fall uh, in London in the fall of 1912, and they put in the core of all our current regulations. They put in the whole uh, the, the call sign system. Britain uh, got M's and uh, the US got W's and, and K's. And, uh, and uh, one of the things there was that uh, at before that, amateurs could do what they want, but they, they, in the famous phrase, the amateurs were given 1500 meters and down actually uh, 200 meters and down <clears throat> 1.5 megahertz so at that point we had everything above 1.5 megahertz and of course that <clears throat> hasn't lasted but uh, they weren't allowed on the low bands because there was complaints that amateurs had interfered with the titanic signals and uh, uh, 
then actually amateurs, you, you probably all know this, but amateurs were the first to cross the Atlantic on short wave. And they, amateurs were the ones that actually proved that the short waves were extremely useful. And uh, this all was the indirect consequence of the Titanic because we were given all, we were excluded from the long waves, which everybody was using and which everybody knew worked. And we were given these rubbish frequencies above 1.5 megahertz. So there's a lot of smart amateurs that there was back in those days. And, and uh, they got busy and they got uh, tubes which would work at those higher frequencies. And sort of consequently, the, 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 the antennas got smaller because they didn't need an enormous antenna for 20, meg, 20 megs or even five megs. What about the use of continuous wave? <clears throat> well, as, as I, I pointed out, the, uh, uh, the actually the five kilowatt synchronous uh, that the Titanic had, had the beginning of continuous wave. At least they had no dead air when you put the key down. It went from a big wave to a smaller one and then a big wave because they got the, the pulses uh, so close together. But it came along with a vacuum tube. And <clears throat> Lee DeForest uh, is an American guy who invented the triode but he wasn't the uh, sharpest knife in the drawer and he didn't really understand what the triode could do. And uh, there was a guy, E.H. Uh, e. Armstrong, who was brilliant. And, and he, he devised, the, uh, he, he built an amplifier, which it amplified with a primitive tube. He built an oscillator. He invented regeneration uh, and he invented the FM radio system among other things. And uh, so really, it was E.H. Armstrong and uh, an improved triode. And then everybody had continuous wave because everybody went over the tubes. In the States, I don't know about England, but in the States, I think it was 1922 that Spark officially became illegal because it was so dirty. And, and uh, you know, uh, it used to call it the DC to daylight transmitter. And uh, so uh, there's no point using them when uh, uh, the vacuum tube CW machine was so much cleaner and was really mostly on one frequency with maybe a, a little bit on the harmonics. Hello there, Fred. Uh, yes, go ahead. Go ahead. It was very, very interesting uh, talk. Thank you very much. Actually, um, um, I joined the railway, Great Western Railway, in 1944. Oh. And uh, as a Te a telegraph operator and um, how we had uh, sounders you probably recognize sorry, had... them <laughs> oh yes oh yes the sounder yeah the sounder and uh and the, and that's a one of the keys but mainly we used the double current keys so with a glass dome on the top and, oh uh, yes i've seen those that... yeah and we used, um, uh, <clears throat> it was all landline there, landline Morse code back then. And uh, it was either sounders yes. or sing single needles. And- um, um, Oh, yes. Yeah, they, they were great. And uh, surprised- Did you uh, just- But- um, I, Just I out of just curiosity. About, you know, it wasn't that long, was it? You know, between- uh, uh, 1912, uh, when they were using SPAR, and uh, then by, you know, the in the Second World War, I mean, tubes were all the rage. I remember I, uh, I became a, a shortwave listener um, after, just after I learned the Morse code when I joined the railway, and in, I still got a little uh, a book, a log book, uh, where I uh, used to keep a log mm -hmm. of uh, the stations I heard, and with just a triode uh, detector, uh, the radio was was named an OVO. If you pro you probably remember that as a VE one, <laughs> um, and I heard I, uh, I, I could listen to CW stations. All over the world, including Hawaii and, and uh, VKs, uh, the, you know. So the advance between the Spark and um, you know, 1940, the 1940, this is incredible. Yes, that's right. It was. It's uh, well. 
uh, the little regenerative receiver, which uh, I believe was popular in Britain with two tubes or three tubes. There would be uh, the regenerative oscillator and an audio tube and sometimes an RF preamp, if it was a fancy one. That's word. correct. And, that and those, correct. And those uh, were, uh, in, in 1924, uh, the, the, the first contact across the, 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 the Atlantic was from Connecticut with such a thing to uh, Marseille. I mean, that's, that's a heck of a hop. And yeah. very soon after that, in the later 20s, uh, the West Coast of the US was talking to New Zealand and Australia on these little two and two, three tube uh, regenerative uh, receivers. That's right. Yeah. So um, it, it came with a rush. Yes, uh, you named the one, two, and three valve ones. Uh, uh, they were designated o, uh, OVO for just a single detector. Uh, uh -huh. OV1 would be a detector plus an amplifier, audio amplifier. Uh, and then a 1V1 would be a an ampli uh, RF amplifier, detector, and audio amplifier, and and that's how it went, you know. But um, was this sort uh, of designation? Uh, amateur radio, I think, was more enjoyable back then than it is now. <laughs> well, well, I often think that I'd love to have been an amateur in the late twenties and early thirties when the short wave was just discovered and the. Uh, radio started to appear that allowed you to really use it and really talk over thousands of miles. Yeah. I mean, you think now that the American organization, the ARRL, is the American Radio Relay League, which got the name because it was formed before World War I. And the, their main activity was to, to coordinate about 10 stations to get a signal from the East Coast to the West Coast. You needed about 10 guys who knew how to properly relay a message. And they would time it, you know, and they'd get the time down to 10 minutes to, to get from the East Coast to the West and, and or, or East to West to back again. So we've, we've come a long way. But uh, anyway, I, I enjoy just uh, figuring out how things work. And, and uh, the more I got into the, the Titanic's radio, the more I realized that uh, it's, it's really clever. They solved things like the QSK, you know, instant back to receive and so forth that I would never have thought that they would have sorted out. I thought they'd have to throw a big lever somewhere, or maybe three big levers, but no, just. Yeah. yeah well, lovely. Thank you, Nicholas. My, incidentally, my call is G3IOI, a license in 1952. Yeah. Wow. And well, congratulations. Welcome, welcome to the meetings. I shall be 91 in a couple of months' time. Yeah, yeah. Lovely. Well, congratulations. Still enjoying uh, radio. Fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> That's well, fantastic. Right, do we have anyone else with a, a question for Fred or a comment before we finish up for the night? No? If uh, not, wait, can we... Please. Yes, go on, Gerald. Yeah, just say thank you very much for a very interesting talk. Yeah, thank you, John. Thank you very much. No, no question. Thank you. Very well. So, the explanation of the detectors and so on was really good. I remember I tried to make a coherer way back in the 50s. Oh, yes. First well, experimenting so. with radios. Yeah, I, I filed down the dime to make the silver granules to go in it. Okay, well, look, can we, can we show our appreciation to uh, to Fred for his talk tonight in the normal way? So, thank you, Fred. It's been uh, a fabulous talk. And uh, later on uh, this year, uh, later on in May, uh, Fred's coming back to do part two of his talk, which is about uh, really the impact that the Titanic had on the development of radio. Uh, so uh, plenty more to talk about there. So we're looking forward to that, Fred. So thank you so much indeed for giving up your time and uh, for, a, for a fascinating um, talk to us tonight in the uh, showing us in, in, in great detail. So well, thank you. Well, thanks so much, Nick. I, I really appreciate it. As I was saying to you previously, uh, what I'd really like is uh, our daughter has taken a job in Newcastle and we really want to get over to see her when all this COVID foolishness is over. And 
I'd yeah. love to drop by your club and give it in person if we did that. Yeah, we'll we'll put you up in Yorkshire, Fred. Don't worry, and uh, <laughs> we'll take you up on that offer. Uh, well, probably see, not this year. Maybe next year would be good. Yeah, yeah, I, I think so. But anyway, yeah. when you said you were going to thank me, I was thinking, gee, if I was there, maybe they'd take me out to the pub, which I would really. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we could do that as well. I'm quite sure. <laughs> All right, brilliant. Thank you, Fred. Well, uh, thank right. you. Before thank we you, Fred. 